Uh, hi everyone. Um, today we are going to continue with uh, the respiratory system and this is the last part that we are going to cover. So today we are going to look at uh, the control of respiration. So what do you understand by control of respiration? So when you look at uh, control of respiration, what are you basically talking about? So just as all systems require a control system, this means that it's a system that's able to regulate how the respiratory system can conduct itself, okay? Just like a society that has got rules and laws that can be guided by it. So you'd find that in certain instances, the respiratory rate might increase or it might be it might reduce. Basically, this is due to the control mechanism of the res uh, respiratory centers. So that's what we are going to look at in this particular topic, okay? So what is control of respiration? So the volume of air inspired and expired per unit time is tightly controlled, okay? Meaning the amount of air that you can be able to inspire and expire can be controlled. And now does this happen? So that's what you're going to talk about today. So both with respect to frequency of breath or uh, both to frequency of breath and to tidal volume. If you remember back then we were talking about lung volumes and capacities. We did define what tidal volume is. Huh? So we define tidal volume as the amount of air inspired and expired under normal breathing or quiet breathing, okay? So you're not supposed to forget all what we looked at before we reached to control mechanism. So breathing is regulated so the lungs can maintain the partial pressure of oxygen and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide within the normal range, okay? Even under widely varying conditions such as exercises, okay? So you might find that as someone is exercising, the respiratory rate might increase. As someone is resting, you are going to find that the respiratory rate might reduce, which is as a result of controlling and regulating the amount of carbon dioxide and the amount of oxygen partial pressures. And the most key function of the control center is to regulate these levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen, because if we have got locks in our bodies, it might lead to hypoxia and other complication. If it might even result to death under waste circumstances. Again, if we have got more carbon dioxide in our body, which is not being gotten rid of, okay, it might result to what we call acidosis. And it's very, very, very bad to a person's health. And as we go on, you're going to realize that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is very, very important in trying to control the respiratory centers, okay? Because there's what we call chemoreceptors that you're going to look at as we move on, which deal with the control of or sensing the amount of these chemicals, such as carbon dioxide, such as uh, oxygen, hydrogen, et cetera, et cetera. So they're being de detected by these control centers that are found inside our human body. So that's what we are going to look at. Allow me to the, go to the next slide. So what you're seeing here is a diagram of control centers. So we have the brain there, okay? Which has got different parts and segments. Then what you are seeing here, which is looking a bit, I don't know if it's blue or, green, uh, or greenish, that's what we call the cerebral spinal fluid. So if you can see, it's going around around the brain. It goes down to the medulla, et cetera, just like, okay? And that's what you have. Then when you go inside, you're going to find that we have got these structures that are found uh, uh, in the brain stem, okay? We have got the pons and the medulla, okay? So breathing control centers stimulated by increasing carbon dioxide, pH, and oxygen, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Then what you're seeing as you follow these arrows, if you can see here, okay? These are nerves signals indicating carbon dioxide and oxygen levels. So they can be able to be detected by different types of uh, receptors that are found in the uh, carotid sinus and also other types of res uh, respiratory detecting uh, structures that are found in the circulatory system, okay? So carbon dioxide and oxygen sensors in the iota. So we'll be able to describe these uh, centers as we go on, or these sensors as we go on. Then as you can see, nerve signals triggered, trigger contraction of muscles. 
So what you're able to see, we have got the diaphragm there and we have got the rib muscles, okay? So these muscles, as you know, there are different types of muscles that are found there. We have got what we call respiratory muscles, such as uh, the ones that are responsible for uh, expiring air and the ones that are responsible for inspiration. So we have got what we call uh, the, we have got what we call uh, the different types of muscles that we discussed under ventilation as you go back. So I won't go in detail because we already looked at this uh, in the previous lectures, such as the intrinsic uh, muscles and extrinsic uh, intercostal muscles, which are found in the rib cage. They are also what we call the expiratory muscles, which are also able to enhance or facilitate gaseous exchange. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. So the goals of breathing from a chemical perspective are to minimize work, okay? So work is the ability, okay, to use energy so that you can accomplish a certain task, okay? So as you know that the muscles of the rosy cavity, they are able to contract and relax, they can do work. And what type of work is that? It's breathing, okay? But again, from a physiological perspective, uh, to maintain blood gases and specifically to regulate arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide. As long, because if you regulate the partial pressure of carbon dioxide, that means you are going to control the breathing rate. What causes someone to start breathing very high is because of when you talk about the concentration of or the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. It's one of the culprits that even goes and regulates how the respiratory centers are able to conduct or control uh, respiration in our human bodies. Then a third goal of breathing is to maintain the acid-based environment of the brain through the effect of ventilation on arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So I'll be able to explain further as we move on in the next few slides, okay? So now, breathing is controlled by centers in the brainstem. There are four components to this control system. One, chemoreceptors for oxygen and carbon dioxide. So we have got chemoreceptors that are able to detect the concentration of oxygen and also carbon dioxide. Again, there's also what we call the mechanoreceptors in the lungs and joints. So this can also influence the amount of carbon dioxide being taken out and being uh, the amount of oxygen being taken in, okay? So chemoreceptors, number one. Secondly, mechanoreceptors in the lungs and joints. Thirdly, we have got what we call the control centers for breathing in the brain, the medulla and the pons, okay? If you can go back, these are the control centers, as you can see, we have got the pons and the medulla. We'll look at that in detail as we go on. Then we also have got what we call, the fourth one is the respiratory muscles, whose activity is directed by the brainstem centers, which is directed by the brainstem centers. So diagram showing control mechanism, okay? So when you look at this diagram, here we have got what we call the brain, okay? So let's go through this diagram bit by bit. By the time we are done looking at this diagram, we can even say we are done with the control of respiration, okay? So now, Let's start with uh, here, uh, if you can see the case, huh? we have got higher brain centers, which is the cerebral cortex and voluntary control over breathing. So the voluntary control over, uh, over breathing, which is coordinated or which is influenced by the cerebral cortex can override the, invol uh, the involuntary brain centers. So you're going to realize that, for instance, in a situation whereby a person is hyperventilating, you can command your brain to say, let me stop hyperventilating just for a short period of time. So that's what they're trying to say about the higher brain centers. They are able to override the involuntary centers which control breathing, okay? So no wonder they're saying it can either be negative or positive feedback. It can either be positive or negative feedback. So now as you go on, what you're seeing here, let's look at this. Let's go where there's the interesting stuff. So what you are seeing here, this is where we have got the pons and the medulla, okay? So now, in a situation, we are going to start with one thing that is very, very common. So here we have got the respiratory centers, which are the medulla and the pons. Then look at this arrow, okay? 
we have got what we call the central chemoreceptors. So these central chemoreceptors are able to detect or pick up, they're able to detect or pick up changes in the concentration of carbon dioxide and hydrogen passing through them, okay? What do you mean by that? There are blood vessels which are flowing in the medulla and the pons. So the centers are able to detect the concentration of hydrogen ions, not carbon dioxide, but hydrogen ions. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a mechanism that we are going to look at in the next few slides, how this is able to happen. So carbon dioxide and hydrogen can be detected. So carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So carbon dioxide results in formation of hydrogen ions. And these hydrogen ions represent acidity. If you can see the way these arrows are, they are showing that we have got higher levels of hydrogen ions or carbon dioxide. What does this mean? It means there's higher levels of metabolism in our body. Hence, the body needs to excrete or to remove the carbon dioxide from our body. But how can it do that? It's by using the control centers of our body, okay, which have to do with respiration. So when you look at this, here is the muscles, okay? They are also able to detect the changes in uh, the changes uh, as the muscles continue to contract, for example, when you're doing strenuous activities, might be sex, might be anything, they are able to detect those changes and elicit a response. So no wonder it's saying receptors in the muscle and joints are able to detect changes in their contraction and in their speed of contractility, which can be a positive feedback. Then when you go to this, we have got also what we call the peripheral chemoreceptors which respond to oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen, okay? So if you can see, these are found in the blood vessels. For instance, the carotid sinus, okay? So they're able to detect the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide flowing through those blood vessels. And they're able to send messages to the respiratory centers to say, okay, let's increase the breathing rate or let's reduce the breathing rate. We have gotten rid of as much carbon dioxide as possible. Then when you look, here on this direction, let me finish here. So now when you look at this, other receptors, e.g. pain can cause also breathing rate to become high or low and emotional stimuli acting through hypothalamus. Imagine a girlfriend finds a guy is cheating on her, okay? She'll start hyperventilating because she's very upset. So that's what we mean by emotional, okay? So it can either be high or low. And what is responsible for coordinating this? It's the hypothalamus. It can be negative or it can be positive, okay? Now, there's also stretch receptors in the lungs that are able to uh, elicit a negative feedback. There's also irritant receptors that are also able to uh, cause a negative uh, or a reduction in terms of the respiration in our body, in terms of the rate. So now, when you look at these two diagrams, these two diagrams are try, just trying to talk about the intercostal muscles, okay? So these intercostal muscles can be influenced. If you remember, we talked about Boy's Law. What was Boy's Law talking about, okay? When you increase the volume, okay, of a certain uh, container, then you the pressure is going to reduce, which means that Boy's Law states that when the volume is increased, okay, the pressure does what? Drops which means the volume is inversely proportional to the pressure. When one factor is being increased, the other one is supposed to drop. So this goes both ways or vice versa. So if you increase the pressure, the volume also does, it drops. So that same phenomenon, that's what causes gases to go out and come in. I believe we did discuss this under ventilation of gases. Then when you look at this, this is the diaphragm. So the diaphragm is a mass that's able to separate, uh, separate the abdominal cavity and the thoracic cavity. It's able to contract and relax. So when it contracts, it's able to flatten, hence increasing the volume of the thoracic cavity. When it relaxes, it forms a doom shaped, hence reducing the volume of the thoracic cavity. So basically, this is how respiration is controlled in summary. But let's go into the details a bit. So voluntary control can also be 
excite, uh, exerted by commands from the cerebral cortex. Breath holding and voluntary hyperventilation. You can, <laughs> you have seen, I'm hyperventilating. Why? Because I'm able to command, say, <laughs> let me hyperventilate. Those are done by the, cere uh, the cerebral cortex of the higher centers of the brain. Even breath holding, those guys who are able to swim and hold their breath underwater, it's because of the cerebral, uh, the cerebral uh, cortex is able to command. No one you are going to understand or realize that breath holding can only happen about three to, it can only happen about three to, uh, actually it's rare that someone can go up to five minutes, okay? But let's just approximate three or 3.5 minutes, okay? Three and a half minutes. I think that can be the maximum someone can go under normal circumstances. So which can temporarily override the brainstem, okay? So meaning this is able to override the pawns and the medulla to say, no, let's start hyperventilating. No, let's start holding the breath, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So now let's start with chemoreceptors. So the brainstem controls breathing by, the, by processing sensory, which is the afferent information and sending motor, which is efferent information to the diaphragm. So the brainstem controls breathing by processing sensory, which is the afferent information, and sending motor, which is the efferent information to the diaphragm, okay? To be able to command it to either contract or relax. So of the sensory information arriving at the brainstem, the most important is that concerning oxygen, carbon dioxide, and arterial pH, meaning the number of hydrogen ions that are found in the blood. But the mechanism of detecting the pH, we are going to talk about it in the next few slides. So now, let's continue. Central chemoreceptors. The central chemoreceptors located in the brainstem are the most important for the minute to minute control of breathing, okay? So among us, all the control centers, the central chemoreceptors, which are found in the pons and the medulla, they're the most important. Okay, so pay attention. These chemoreceptors are located on the vertebral surface of the medulla near the point of exit of the glossopharyngeal, which is cranial nerve number nine, and the vagus nerve, which is cranial number 10. So nerves and only a short distance from the medulla inspiratory centers, okay? So between the central chemoreceptors and the medullary ins inspiratory centers, it's just a short distance. So meaning coordination is very swift and efficient. Thus, central chemoreceptors communicate directly with the inspiratory center. The brainstem chemoreceptors are exquisitely sensitive to changes in the pH of cerebrospinal fluid. What they're trying to say is that the brain centers are able to detect any different or even slight fluctuation in the pH of the cerebral spinal fluid. How that happens, you are going to learn it, don't worry. Decreasing the pH of the cerebral spinal fluid produces increases or increase in breathing rate, which is hyperventilation, and increases in the pH of the cerebral spinal fluid produces decrease in breathing rate, okay? So, when the number of hydrogen ions decrease, it means there's acidity, meaning the pH is acidic. It's going to cause the increase in breathing rate because we have got a lot of carbon dioxide. You're going to see how hydrogen ions are produced in the cerebrospinal fluid. And you're going to understand how this is related to carbon dioxide. And increases in the pH of the cerebrospinal fluid produces decreases in the breathing rate. Which is hypo ventilation because the pH has dropped to alkalinity, you understand. So this is what we are going to discuss. So now let me just go to the diagram. I think I better, I, I enjoy explaining diagrams as compared to notes. So now when you look at this diagram, this diagram is just talking about central chemoreceptors. So here, if you see, we have got what we call carbon dioxide, which is found in the capillary surrounding the Pons and the medulla or the brain, uh, I mean, the respiratory centers. So we have capillaries there. And uh, when you look at these same capi uh, capillaries, let me just go back a bit. So now you're going to realize that we have these capillaries. Then these capillaries are transporting carbon dioxide and water, which is coming from the metabolic activities happening in the cells. 
So carbon dioxide is going to react with water in the presence of an enzyme known as carbonic anhydrase, okay? And I'm sure you know where this reaction happens. If you remember what you talked about under carbon dioxide transport, carbonic anhydrase is found explicitly in the red blood cells, and that's where the reaction happens. So carbon dioxide in the capillary surrounding the respiratory centers, carbon dioxide and water are going to react to produce bicarbonate, a carbonic acid, which is going to disassociate into hydrogen ions and also uh, bicarbonate. But this has got no significance to controlling uh, the respiratory centers. So as you move, you're going to find that carbon dioxide is able to diffuse across the blood barrier, the, uh, sorry, the blood brain barrier. So if you can see stage number one, carbon dioxide diffuses into the medulla, okay? So carbon dioxide here has got no effect. So what's going to happen? The carbon dioxide will continue to move until it's able to diffuse into the cerebrospinal fluid, but it's going to be allowed by only what we call the brain cerebrospinal fluid barrier. It's only able to allow carbon dioxide. It cannot allow water. It cannot allow bicarbonate to be able to diffuse. So once carbon dioxide goes there, carbon dioxide is going to react with water to form bicarbonate, okay? Then bicarbonate is going to disassociate to form hydrogen ions and bicarbonate, okay? So carbon and water will react to form carbonic acid and that carbonic acid is going to disassociate to form hydrogen ions and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate remains there while the hydrogen ions at stage four is able to cross the brain spinal fluid barrier and go into the central receptor. These central receptors can detect or pick up the concentration of hydrogen ions in the medulla and say, okay, for us to have a higher concentration of hydrogen ions, that means we have got a higher concentration of carbon dioxide. Hence, let's increase the respiratory rate. That those commands are going to be picked up by the inspiratory centers, which are going to send messages to the thoracic muscles and other structures that can elevate the respiratory rate. It's also going to send messages to the heart to say, okay, start pumping fast so that the carbon dioxide can go faster to the lungs and it can be gotten rid of. So this is just a basic mechanism of what happens or what transpires. So in summary, the goal of the central chemoreceptor is to keep arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide within the normal range if possible. Thus, increases in arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide produces increases in partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the brain and the spinal fluid, cerebral spinal fluid, which decreases the pH of the cerebral spinal fluid. A decrease in the cerebral spinal fluid pH is detected by central chemoreceptors for hydrogen ions, which instruct the inspiratory centers to increase the breathing rate. When the breathing rate increases, more carbon dioxide will be expelled and the arterial partial pressure of carbon will decrease towards normal, okay? Let's go to the peripheral chemoreceptors. There are peripheral chemoreceptors for oxygen, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen in the carotid bodies, okay? We have in the carotid bodies located at the bifurcation uh, of the common carotid arteries and in the aortic bodies above and below the aortic arc. That's where they are located, okay? They are near, there are some which are near to the heart, okay? So information about arterial partial pressure of carbon dioxide, partial pressure of oxygen, and the pH is relayed to the medullary inspiratory center via cardio nerve number nine and cardio nerve number 10, which is the vagus nerve, which, was, uh, which, 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 produces, uh, which produces an appropriate change in breathing or an appropriate response. So this is what this diagram is just trying to talk about. So if you look at it, here we have got what we call the peripheral chemoreceptors. Here we have got the central chemoreceptors, lung strength receptors, and muscle and joint receptors. So here is the afferent. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen can be detected. They can be transported by cranial nerve number nine and cranial nerve number 10, which goes to the inspiratory center and elicit a response, okay? So we have got positive response is produced or is uh, facilitated by the apneustic center, while negative is by the pneumotaxic center, okay? 
Now, when you look at uh, the central chem uh, chemoreceptors there, halogen can cause these inspiratory centers to cause a change in the breathing rate, either to increase or reduce. We also have the stretch receptors there, which goes via the cranial nerve, uh, number 10, which is the vagus nerve. We also have the muscle and joint receptors. Then the efferent uh, uh, nerve, which is known as the, uh, uh, the phrenic nerve, which goes to the diaphragm and respiratory muscles in the thoracic cavity and cause a change and also go to the human heart and cause either the increase in breathing rate, the increase in the heart rate, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what happens there. So each of the following changes in the arterial blood composition is detected by the peripheral chemoreceptors and produces an increase in the breathing rate, decreases in the arterial partial pressure. The most important responsibility of the peripheral chemoreceptors is to detect the changes in the arterial partial pressure of oxygen. Surprisingly, however, the peripheral chemoreceptors are relatively insensitive to changes in the partial pressure of oxygen. They respond when the partial pressure decreases to less than 60 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so this is more stuff trying to talk about what we are supposed to cover. Okay, and what we have talked about. So, in conclusion, so here are what we call the other receptors. So, in addition to chemoreceptors, there are several other types of receptors that are involved in the control of breathing, including number one, we have got lung stretch receptors, two, we have got joint and muscle receptors. Number three, we have got irritant receptors. And number four, there's what we call the just capillary receptors, okay? Just means next to, okay? So meaning they are near the capillaries, one of them are known as the J receptors, okay? So this is just the information which will talk about how these receptors are able to conduct their function. So again, we can end here and we can complete the topic from here. Thank you very much uh, for your time and enjoy the video.